What's up, all you night owls? We are broadcasting live from sunny Southern California on KTLK Digital Broadcasting Fringe FM. It's Wednesday, October 2nd, or Thursday, October 3rd, depending on where you are. I'll welcome you all to the Just Rogi Show. I'm Just Rogi. This is a show, a show that tries to find out more about the reality that we live in, because, because guys, there's so much that's been hidden, so much more to be discovered. Also, I want to welcome you guys to the Fringe FM Late Night, where five nights a week you guys get six hours of live Fringe talk here on the Fringe.fm. Fringe FM Late Night starts with 7 p.m. with Michael Strange, who hosts Troubled Minds. Followed by Lighting the Void, hosted by Joe Roop at 9 p.m. And then this show, The Just Rogie Show, at 11 p.m. Pacific. If you guys want to help support the show, you can head over to buymeacoffee.com and search Just Rogie. 
And if you can't support the show monetarily, there's other ways to help. Share the show on social media, like the show on YouTube, or share it with a friend who may like this type of content. Also, guys, before we get into it, I want to remind you to follow me on social media, The Jess Rogi Show on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram. All right. Can you see me? Can you see me? I know we got more people in the house. I'm going to greet you guys in just a moment. I just want to apologize. I about last night wasn't feeling well. I was able to rest my voice. So here we are today. Tomorrow night, guys, we have Preston Dennett joining us. He's going to be here talking about his new book. So let's see who's in the chat, and then we'll get to our guests. I want to move right through that, because I know we got a lot to cover tonight with our guests, and I know a lot of you are excited here and have been excited for this guest tonight, for Louie to come on and talk about Freemasonry and the Knights Templar. Let's say who's here tonight. We have three chats going tonight, guys. We have the Mixed Cloud for the Fringe FM going tonight. So you can head over there and hang out. We have a live video feed on there. You guys can see me on there, too. We got video. We're also on YouTube tonight. Where we got Sarah. We got UAP Studies. What's up, Dimensions of Reality? Hello, Brian. Hello, Sylvain. Thanks for joining us. MJ, I hope you guys brought your questions. What's up, Chris Jones? I'll make sure I got everybody. Thank you guys so much for hanging out. What's up, Earl the Gray? Good to see you. Glad you could hang out. What's up, Spooky? Spooky, Spooky. We got Wally in the house. Jojo Bones. Thanks for hanging out. Good to see you. All right. So let's let's get to uh, our guest bio here. We're going to bring him on real quick. So tonight... Our guest is my good friend, Louis Borges. He's a third degree master mason, a 32 degree Scottish Rite mason, and members and a member of the York, York Rite and the Cryptic Rite of Freemasonry. Louis is also the member of the Knights Templar and is an active officer in his preceptory. In 2007, Louis became the member of the Lynn Masonic Lodge No. 416 in Ontario, Canada where he maintains his craft lodge membership to this day. Louis was the youngest candidate in Canada in 2008 to receive his 32nd degree of Scottish Rite Freemasonry. Louis also belongs to several allied Masonic bodies as well as invitational knighthood assemblies. You can catch Louis along with his co-host Jason Goulomet on their UAP Studies podcast, which is available on YouTube Apple Podcast, or wherever you find your favorite podcast. So, without further ado, let me get Louie on here. So, let me do this, and let's see if I do this right. Ready? One, two, three. Boom. Damn. Here we go. How you doing, Jess? Good. How are you? I'm so excited for this. I don't even want to give anything away about what we're going to talk about tonight, but... Yeah, for me, it was... uh, I had to think about it, because it's like, this is the most one of the most like fringe topics, the most misunderstood topics wrapped in conspiracy theory. I thought, you know what, this is a fringe program. I'm going to get fed to the wolves here, but yeah. I'm doing it for a reason. And the reason being is that this is a dying fraternity. The average Mason is like 60 to 80 years old. I can't think of anybody who's 18 to 35 that really knows much about it or really wants to spend that extra time to get to know about it. So I wanted to spell a lot of the myths. You know, you go on Google, you type in what is Freemasonry. It's loads of nonsense. And the sad part is the truth is out there too. Um, you know, there are really not that many secrets as people would think. And you can find all that if you're good at internet searching and all the rest. So I, I'm kind of twofold. I want to dispel the myth uh, and some of the misinformation out there. Two, I like talking about it. Obviously, I, I'm this involved and I got this involved at a young age and, uh, you know, I don't talk much about it, but on paper, I have more credentials than 95% of most of the Freemasons on the planet, you know? And so I really (laughs) took a liking to this and I want to discuss the reasons for that and uh, what it did for my life, just in terms of changing the way you think. So uh, yeah, I'm here to answer all your questions. I'm not going to hold anything back. Uh, Again, I'd rather pique somebody's interest that wants to get involved than, uh, you know, kind of keep the old guard, like the 80 year old, just say, oh, we don't talk about it. You know, I've attended Masonic funerals where the family had no idea that the deceased was a Mason. And here we are paying respect. And like they were in World War II when, you know, they heard don't talk about it. They're military. They don't talk about it. And they took it to their grave. So if we don't get a little more of that information out there, I don't think this thing that I love and three and a half million other people around the world who are Masons, 
Uh, it's not going to survive if we don't dispel that myth. So I'm going against the grain. I don't know of anybody who's gone on a uh, big platform and talked openly about what is Freemasonry, but we're going to get into what it is, what the degrees look like, what's the symbolism attached. Uh, you know, we'll talk about the Knights Templar later on. I have some of my regalia if you guys want to see aprons and I got a sword over here and my mantle. And so we'll get into all the good stuff. I'll answer anything. Uh, and if, you know, feel free to, there is no stupid question. You know, I, nobody's going to get their head ripped off except me, I'm sure. So except you, right. Well, here um, we go. So let's start, let's start at the beginning. What got you interested in this? So my grandfather was in the second world. I call him my grandfather. My, my biological grandfathers both passed away before I was born. Uh, but my grandmother was living common law with a man for like 25 years when I was actually born. So I considered him my grandfather and he was in the second world war and we used to go to like Veterans Day Parade and he had a very different uniform and a lot of like high up people with many medals would always come and greet him. And I later found out he was very decorated. He was a, uh, a medic and a stretcher bearer. So imagine a guy gets shot in the head in the field. He's running to the exact same spot where the bullet just flew to grab that guy and save his life. So very honorable man. And I knew if he was a part of something, it wasn't anything bad. I never really knew what it was about. I just knew it was kind of cool and. You know, I, I wanted to get into it at some point. I also have an uncle who was very uh, decorated and did a lot. So um, and yeah, so I initially I wanted to get involved. Uh, I was uh, managing a car dealership at one point and uh, an older guy came in and bought a car and I chatted with him for like two and a half hours. And he was like the nicest man I ever spoke to. And I saw that he had all these rings. I said, what are those? And he goes, well, that's my Masonic ring. That's my Shriners ring. That's my 33rd degree ring. And I said, oh, you're a Mason. So I told him what I knew and you know, I would like to get more information. He says, okay. He goes, uh, leave it with me and somebody might come by to chat with you. And uh, about a week later, I had another customer in and what had happened was my grandfather uh, had passed away and I wanted to get his Masonic ring and I couldn't. So I found one at a flea market and I bought it. And so again, I got a customer a week later and I'm wearing this ring and he goes, uh, what lodge do you belong to? And I said, oh no, I, I don't belong to a lodge. I, I just talk to a guy and he goes you shouldn't be wearing that ring you're not a freemason and ripped my head off and embarrassed me really and i said listen i had spoken with a man i told him that i have an interest i go this is in homage to my grandfather it's no disrespect to your fraternity and he kind of quieted down and said listen there's a reason that we have these rules and if you're that interested then you need to get involved and he's like has anybody come to see you yet and i said no like i you know the guy said he's you know gonna send someone and he goes, leave it with me. Someone will come see you in the next day or so. And uh, sure enough, the next day I had a customer in the showroom and I talked with him for five minutes about the vehicle. And he goes, uh, you're Louie, right? And I knew right away. I'm like, this is so cool. They sent a guy to come chat with me. I'm like, yeah, let's uh, come on over to my office. And he goes, I understand you want to be a Mason and why? I told him about my grandfather. And he goes, uh, I said, yeah. And you got you guys are here because of Renee. And he's like, who's Renee? I said, the little old man. I told him I wanted to be Mason. He goes, no, we're here because of Dave. And Dave was the a-hole that ripped my head off. And uh, so oddly enough, it wasn't that original lodge. And I later came to found out that it got lost somewhere in translation. Like these are all 60 to 80 year old men forgetful. And they had a, a petition from a member that, hey, there's a guy that wants to learn about this. And either way, so I got by accident, I bumped into two Masons from two different lodges. The first one got lost, but the second one didn't. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I guess the easiest way to explain what it is, is to kind of explain my story. So he asked me a bunch of questions, you know, uh, how old am I? Um, you know, do I have any criminal record? Have I ever gotten in trouble with anything? Do I believe in a supreme being? Not necessarily religious, but, you know, like, do I believe there is a creator? And, you know, what do I want to attain out of this? Is it for business reasons and all the rest? And I said, no, it's just out of a, a curious, you know, nature. And my grandfather was involved and I know there's something good. I know there's a charitable aspect to it. Just want to find out more. And then uh, he goes, okay. And then about three weeks passed by, nothing happened. And I got a letter in the mail that basically said that my name was petitioned forward in open lodge, balloted upon, and the ballot was favorable. And I'm to present myself at this East door at this date and this time. I was like, this is just like the bloody movies, right? Like very cool. <laughs> and, uh, like normally a Masonic Lodge has a meeting and then they'll have like like food after or whatever. I came to learn later on this particular lodge, um, they it's so ancient. It was from like 1858, I think it was built. And they actually had a thing where 
they changed the dinner to before the meeting because it was in the age of horse and buggy. And if they didn't feed the horse and let them eat, then they wouldn't have any energy to take them home. So they couldn't feed everyone at the end. They started doing it early. So I was fortunate enough to sit with all these men before the meeting. Most Masons show up and there's one guy there and you have no idea what's about to happen. And they're all upstairs preparing and getting ready for you. So I at least got that familiarity to know that, hey, these are cool guys. Like I'm chatting with a 90 year old man and I feel like he's my cousin, you know, like same Aww. sense of humor, same interest, same, you know, very well spoken, very polite courteous so i knew you know they would drop jokes and oh we're getting the goat out tonight and all this stupid stuff and i knew <laughs> it was going to fun. and i knew they're all here so they all lived to tell about it couldn't be yeah. that bad it and, be uh, yeah basically like here we go you want to know what it's like being a mason so you show up you are dressed a certain way uh, i won't go into what that dress is it's easily researchable you can go online and find that but essentially you're put in different garments to deprive you of what's familiar. Uh, you're deprived of all metals. There's no jewelry. It, it, it's a state of humility. And it's you and a total stranger standing outside of this room. There's a guy also standing there. And uh, you can hear them talking inside. And then you hear three loud knocks. And then three more loud knocks. And three more loud knocks. And next thing you know, the door opens. And you're in this ceremony. It's like a play. And, you know, they're asking, you know, who comes here. And the guy that you're with does all the speaking for you because you, you don't, don't know talk what to go through, right? So they're asking questions. They say your name. What's the purpose? You know, what do you seek? You know, he seeks information. He seeks light. Does he have the password? No, but I have it for him. That kind of thing, right? And uh, eventually they close the door. You hear them mumbling and talking and door opens back up. You know, you'll enter, but proceed with caution for you don't, you don't know what you enter, right? And uh, you go into it, everything's dark. You don't know. You can hear, you know, like, <clears throat> and like people, the jingling of their aprons and all the regalia. So, you know, there's people in the room, but you don't know who it is. And you just proceed to go through the station. So you walk a little bit and you turn around and the guy asks the question, your guide answers for you and you get passed on to the next station. Same thing. It's question and answer. And finally, you work your way back around to the middle and you're facing the front and you can hear the master of the lodge speak. And he's now grilling your guardian about why are you here? You know, is he of the correct age? He is, worshipful sir. You know, is he of the tongue of good rapport? Meaning you have a good reputation. He is. Um, you know, does he come of his own free will and accord? He does. What does he seek? He seeks light. And so they say, well, and you will kneel and take an oath on your honor that you won't reveal any of the secrets of Freemasonry. Now, secrets, quote unquote, have many aspects. And I'll go over that. We got two hours tonight. I'll clear that up. But in this setting, the secrets are the things that we keep true to what it means to be a Mason, right? So you kneel, you take an oath on your honor, then you stand up, you're now enlightened, you're no longer blindfolded, you could see there's 50 guys standing in a room in full regalia, like dressed to the nines. And they basically explain why you just went through that, the purpose of you being blindfolded. And, you know, had you not had pure intentions and had you not had the correct answer and the confidence of your guide, you wouldn't have made it this far. Now they give you the secrets of Freemasonry, which is basically the history, the symbology. So they explain that this comes from a time roughly about 2,500 years ago, the building of King Solomon's temple. And many scriptures talk about that, you know, the Bible, the Torah, the Quran, they all reference Solomon. And essentially it was believed to be the first building in stone for God. So people like this predates religion, right? If you're going back 2,500 years, like the Jews have just basically had their first king. Solomon's like the first king of the Jews. Christianity hasn't come around. Islam hasn't come around. And nobody's literate. Nobody reads, nobody writes, except for heads of state and religious people, the ones that read the doctrine and profess, right? So they have all the information. How do they convey moral truths to people who can't understand very high level of anything? They do it with symbolism. So you're taught about the building of Solomon's temple, how it was meant to house the Ark of the Covenant, which was like the only thing the Jews had saved from their exodus from Egypt. And supposedly the Ten Commandment tablets were in it and they wanted to build now that God freed them as per their belief. Uh, some pretty crazy things happen in the exodus story, right? Moses parts the waters and the Egyptians and plagues and all that stuff, right? So they've made it. Now it's time to say thank you. 
they have a king and they're going to dedicate all the resources to building a temple fit for God in their mind. So it was the most important project in their lives and ever since, you know what I mean? So, um, so basically what happens is you're then explain sort of the furniture of the lodge. So, you know, there's a, a block that's all rough and like unrefined. And then there's a smooth like marble one. And you explain that, you know, a man is very similar to a stonemason's tool. So as we are not stonemasons, but rather operative or Freemasons, we adapt those tools to our morality. So like, if you look at like, here's my Masonic ring. So that's, that's the Masonic logo. It's a compass and a square with a G. So the square is to live your life on the level, everything on the 90 degree. If you're making a building and you don't square each block, it's not long. Your building's all crooked and it's not going to stand. So emblematically of building in stone, build your life the same way. Deal with people honestly. Don't screw anybody. That type of thing. The compass is about measure and keeping your passions and due balance, everything in moderation, that type of thought. And the G, depending who you ask, and a lot of Masons debate this, it stands for geometry or it stands for the grand architect or God, so to speak. Oh, so okay. that's the basic tenets of Freemasonry. And, you know, they you go through once you've been enlightened and taken your oath, there's all these various lectures. So a guy will walk up, stand in front of you and rattle off a 20 minute lecture in like very old English. You know, oh. it's just him talking. He's reading you a script that he's memorized that every single Mason who's ever been initiated a Mason went through the exact same way. So some of the words, you don't quite understand what they are, but you begin to appreciate the fact that this old guy memorized this thing. And he's like an actor right now. Like he owns the floral store downtown, but right now this guy's the man, like he's, he's taken the time to memorize this and pause the right way and all the rest. And you go through, you know, explaining why there's certain lights and where they are, why the floor is like a mosaic tile um, you know, that smooth and rough block that symbolizes the man pre-Mason and then what he's working on. So you may be a block, but you're very rude form. You're not very refined. It's definitely not something fit for a temple. But the aim of this is to get those smooth edges to perfect your craft, so to speak, and uh, make something worthy of, you know, uh, a building fit for God. Right. So it's emblematic of your life and how you want to live. And what kind of, you know, even our aprons, I have one here, actually. Can we see it? Yeah. Yeah, I've got a bunch of stuff I brought down because I wasn't sure about it. Yeah, I'd like to see. Do you mind showing the ring again? Somebody in the chat, fellow city Zens in the chat said they couldn't sure. quite see the symbol. Yeah, so this is my ring. I had this one custom made because it has three things. But that's your standard Masonic logo. You see it on bumper stickers. You see it on buildings. We wear it on our rings, uh, you know, websites. Uh, mine also has this on the other side, which is represents a Scottish rite or 32 degree, which I'll explain. And then that is my Templar insignia on the front. So I had this one made to kind of because you can't have you can't have this one without that one. And you can't have this one without that one and one more. So it's kind of like the triplicate for me. But but um, yeah, so uh, when you first get initiated and you go through it all, you get a white leather apron. And it's explained to you that like stonemasons would have a leather apron, they have a block and a hammer and chisel in case the chisel slips, it doesn't go through your leg. So we have white aprons emblematic of our morals and of our reputation. So when you die, are you still going to have a white apron or what's it going to look like after all of your labors in your life? So the first degree, you're initiated with a white leather apron. Second degree is what they call a fellow craft, which is basically a workman. Now you have the basics of your job. You're honing your skills. You're learning. It sort of symbolizes that middle part of your life, you know, adulthood, you know, emblematic of the first degree is like birth. You come from darkness to light. You didn't know what's what. Now you do. And you use the goodness you learn to benefit yourself moving forward. So second degree is very explanatory of the duties you now have. You know, you wanted to be a part of this. You're seeking, you know, the secrets of masonry. Well, in order to do that, you have to understand yourself and you have to help other people because that's the only way you benefit the common stock, only way you're ever going to get to the true secrets of master masonry. And it's very similar to the, the first degree, except in the fact that in the first degree, you're taught how to identify yourself as a mason. And you need to memorize those few things because before you can re-enter a lodge to take your second degree, you have to do what's called prove your proficiency. 
You know, they ask you a bunch of trick questions and the answer isn't what you would think. You know, they may say, where were you made a Mason? You don't say Atlanta. There's one okay. answer in the planet that works, right? So it's meant to prove that you went through your first degree and now you're basically seeking admission to a lodge and they want to know that you know what's up, right? So you prove yourself, then you go through in the second. You're dressed slightly differently. Same thing, you have a guide, but this time you have some of the answers because it's the same answers you learned from the first. So what is your purpose? Now you can speak on your own. Guide's still there. So, and there's other things where, you know, they will ask you things and he'll tell you what to answer. So all the new parts you have the guide for, the old parts you already know. Same thing. Now you go to Master Mason, which is about as high as everybody goes in Freemasonry. Most guys don't go any higher than third degree. And that's sort of the culmination of them all. And I know we're coming close on a break, so I can divulge a little bit. But I'll show the apron first. So this yeah. is my third degree Master Mason apron. So most of them, sometimes you'll see they're like a dark blue. They may have an insignia here. But essentially, my lodge in my district uses this color. And the gold on the edges is because we're what's considered an ancient lodge, like 200 years old. So okay. it's an insignia on the apron of those members that when we go to another lodge, people will know that just by looking at what our apron looks like. That's and where like, you're from. Yeah, there's like writing under the flap. And uh, yeah, and this changes as well when you become a master. These become uh, little levels instead. Uh, I progress higher in other forms of Freemasonry, more so than my craft lodge. But uh, yeah, you can't go any higher unless you're a man. And in terms of like rank and like that's third degree, I'm a 32nd degree, it means nothing. There is no greater lesson in the eyes of masonry than the third degree itself. Like that is the culmination that gives you the, the game plan from one, two and three. You have enough to impact other people. It's only for guys that are really into it, that want to learn more. Sometimes they're very studious and. We like doing speaking parts and I loved it. As soon as I went through, I'm like, how do I become a part of that? Like, I want to memorize that lecture that that guy just read out. Like, that was amazing. And so I was instantly hooked and I loved doing the hard parts and taking three months to memorize something letter perfect. And so, but there are guys that aren't that way and they'll do other things or they'll just show up when they show up and they like to have coffee with their buddies and watch some guy get initiated and be there to support and that's the extent of what they contribute, right? The body as a whole does the charity by just showing up. It does nothing, right? So you can participate as much or as little as you have time for, you know, it can't interfere with your family or your work. That's very important. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. And some guys just go all in and really want to absorb it all. And I did, I mean, for five years, I did every single thing I possibly could. And uh, yeah, now I'm on the Jess Rogie show. You're on the Jess Rogie Show live on the Fringe FM, live to YouTube, live to Mixcloud, talking about it right now. But we're going to have to go on our first break, everyone. So I want everyone to stay tuned. Do not go anywhere. We're going to be right back with more with Louis Borges. We are talking about, we are he's demystifying. Trying. He's trying to demystify, but kind of take the mystery away from him and tell you guys what Freemasonry really is about. And so far, it's been really interesting, and I can't wait to hear more. We're seeing some of his regalia, some of his uh, Freemasonry gear. So stay tuned, guys. We'll be right back. Don't you go anywhere. Let me turn this off. We'll be right back. My name is Alex Exum, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. Musicians experience a lot of frustration with music marketing and promotion. They have no idea how to get their music heard, and they're spending hours sending emails, making phone calls, and hitting up their friends to promote them. With our industry-powered digital marketing platform, we can set up your media plan in minutes. Our team will automatically distribute your music across all the best channels, so you can focus on actually making the music. Submit your music today on our website at mymusicpromoter.com. That's mymusicpromoter.com. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? 
You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in paranormal talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. What are you doing late nights? Join me, Jess Rogie, the host of The Jess Rogie Show. We have a new show title and a new time slot. Become part of the show by calling in and joining in on the conversation. We'll discuss a wide variety of topics, including everything from consciousness, conspiracies, current events, fringe topics, pop culture, and so much more. Let's see where the night takes us. Join us live five nights a week, Monday through Friday at 11 p.m. Pacific, 2 a.m. Eastern. Right after Lighting the Void with Joe Roop on KTLK Digital Broadcasting, The Fringe FM. Listen, as we explore the mysteries of the universe, the unknown, high strangeness, consciousness, and our human potential, Lighting the Void is an eclectic program that strives to ignite the late night with stimulating conversations. Join us on The Fringe FM. Tired of talking about the weather? No, Shift. Well, Shift Happens is here to fulfill your desires. As you reach that point in life where you crave tantalizing conversation about reality, ufology, the occult, and the conspiracies within, while simultaneously finding yourself desperately in need of your very own theme music, which we've got plenty of that too. So be sure to tune in to Shift Happens every Friday night from 7 to 9 Pacific, right here on The Fringe FM. Because the weather sucks, and you need some theme music. If you suffered in silence or experienced stress from a paranormal experience, even if it happened 20 years ago, when thinking or talking about it today still makes you feel sick to your stomach or makes your heart beat faster, or you suddenly can't breathe, maybe you even feel those old familiar signs of a panic attack trying to reach the surface. You could have unprocessed emotional responses. Those reactions of terror and trauma are no different than living through a horrible assault, childhood abuse, or a terrible car accident. It can be nearly impossible to find help. The very instance of seeing a ghost or encountering a cryptid could be clinically described as seeing or hearing things that aren't there. You could be considered psychotic, or at best, you're just not taken seriously. Out of a growing mountain of research, the National Institute for Integrative Healthcare showed that 8 out of 10 veterans who completed just 6 one-hour EFT sessions no longer tested positive for PTSD. If you've had paranormal trauma, you can contact Metaphorical Archaeology by calling 214-995-3754. Again, that's 214-995-3754 for a discreet consultation. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back. Let me get this video off here. We're back live on KTLK, digital broadcasting, Fringe FM. This is the Jess Rogie Show. Let me get that camera on. Let me get Louie back on here. Let's see here. We're going to go like this, though. And Damn. let me get my camera back on. Bam! Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back to the show. Are you having fun? I'm having fun. Yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm trying to make it digestible for everybody because I could just go blah and nobody will understand a bloody thing. So trying to make it chronologically. And, you know, we mentioned the other degrees and how does that progress? And so we were talking about the third degree, the master Mason, the perfecting degree. So in that degree, you're told a story and you can look this up online and it's very well known, but basically it's the three principal characters of the building of King Solomon's temple. So you have King Solomon, 
You have Hiram, King of Tyre, which I believe is now Iran nowadays. And you have Hiram Abiff, who was the, the master mason architect of the Stone Project. And you're told the story of there were three, um, they call them ruffians, three lesser workmen that kept approaching Hiram Abiff and saying, we want to know the secrets to a master mason. And Hiram would always reply, I cannot divulge that, nor will I, unless in the presence of the other two. And, you know, they kept asking, kept asking. So one day he was accosted by all three. And they basically said, you either tell us the secrets of a master mason. And they weren't of that rank to be able to attain that, right? So, and again, this may never have happened, but this is the allegory and this is the, the mythical story that goes with it. So um, they, uh, they accost him and say, if you don't tell us the secrets of a master mason, we're going to kill you. Again, he refuses, says, I cannot and I will not unless I'm in the presence of the other two. So one of the men strike him over the head. He's injured and stumbles. Another one approaches him and says, you better tell us. He refuses again. They strike him again. He's basically barely still alive. And the third one approaches and said, like, you have one last chance. And again, Hiram Abiff would rather die than give away the secrets of a master mason. And uh, he winds up being killed. The, oh. These guys, they bury his body. They put a loose acacia branch over it and try to hide it. So the next day, Ken Solomon's holding court and there's no Hiram Abiff. So he sends out a search party. They find him in no time buried uh, with his injuries. And they found three members that weren't with the search party. So very clearly, those are the guilty parties. And uh, essentially, the whole basis of that story is that even when there's good and the intent is good, evil is still there. And sometimes evil does things it's not supposed to do. Like the least deserving people can get that sometimes. And how do you deal with that mentally? You know, so um, you're, then you're told in this ceremony that with the death of Hiram Abiff, so is the, the loss of the true secrets of a master mason. So in the meantime, we've adopted certain gestures, tokens, passwords, handshakes or, or grips to replace those original secrets. And then you're given the handshake, the password, all those things that your guardian was giving on your behalf, you never heard. Now you're getting, you know, you're getting all the goods. You're a master mason. You've reached epitome. But that's a 2,500 year old story. So for guys like me, we start to say, well, nothing's happened since then. Like what happened after? That's like, that's the end of the book. Like, it's not Scientology where they're like, yeah, now that you got to the top, you better start over again. You know, like, so <laughs> for those people, there is a continuation of the story. And Masonry didn't die at that point. It just continued for the next 2,500 years. And then you wind up having uh, appended bodies, what they call the Scottish Rite. And even though it's called the Scottish Rite, it's actually how Freemasonry was practiced in France. So it's an assembly of all those degrees in a digestible system that somebody can attain. Again, they're all pretty well the same. They have a moral lesson. Um, in, the, in the first three degrees, you're the character going through. You're very much a part of that. When you go for the Scottish Rite, I went to a different city about an hour away. It was this massive theater with like backdrops and speakers and sound. And there was about 30 guys and we're all sitting in the stands of this theater. And like the show opens and it's like a Masonic Lodge on the floor. All the guys are sitting in the right place. They're all dressed in costume and they're all mic'd up and they're acting out this play. So in the Scottish Rite, you watch the play done by guys that are really good. No books. They memorize their lines. And through the allegory of the story, there's a moral lesson. You stand, you take an oath not to reveal, you know, the importance of the things you learn. Not that they would spoil anything, but if you were just taught a greater good of how to improve your life, you should reserve that for somebody who really wants that. And by getting that, you've shown you really want that because here you are a Mason and now you're continuing. And the Scottish Rite is a system that goes from the fourth degree all the way up to the 32nd degree. It took me like a year and a half to do it. And I drove through snowstorms and all kinds of stuff just to get there. So I wouldn't miss the degree. And um, at the 18th degree, you're knighted uh, in, in the French way. And it's very chivalric. It's amazing. Like you go through this and you feel like you're 2000 years ago and you know that every other person who's gone through this had the exact same thing happen. It kind of changes you. And I'm already a guy that dig the, the ceremony and the speeches. Now they got costumes and like <laughs> backdrops and scenery and props. Like they take this seriously. And uh, I got, like yeah, I got really involved with that. And uh, that was sort of on the Eastern part of the country. 
And then I was sort of at a crossroads in my own personal career. I wasn't liking the kind of people I was working for. I work a pretty uh, aggressive business. You know, it's kind of what have you done for me lately? Lots of pressure. And uh, I always enjoyed the West Coast. I would come out for five or 10 days and feel so refreshed. And I'd go back and be miserable for another year. So I just made the decision I was going to move to the West Coast and see where it went. And uh, luckily, everything worked out. I got a job right away and everything was good. And then I thought, well, how do I progress from here? I've done the Scottish Rite. What else is there? Well, I want to be a Knights Templar. Well, then you come to find out that you have to be a Royal Arch Mason or a York Rite Mason to, to go through that before you can apply to be a Templar. So very similar to my other degrees. It's a continuation of the same story. Uh, and the York Rite is how masonry was practiced in England. And it's three degrees. And basically, it picks up from the story. So Hiram Abiff is dead. The secrets are lost. 70 years after that, the temple was actually destroyed and overrun by other people. And um, the, the Templars or, you know, the original people that went back to, to find it, they went underneath the temple. They went into like the crypt, hence is the term cryptic masonry. And it's the story of them finding some amazing things underneath the Temple of Solomon that, I mean, the looters took all the stuff above, but they knew there was something below because that's what used to hold and house the Ark of the Covenant and all these other things. So that's where the whole Knights Templar comes in and the Holy Grail and everything else. So essentially, if you look at, you know, fast forward a couple hundred years, you now have Christianity, you know, the, the death of Jesus. And that's starting to spread throughout Europe and other countries. Well, there's no cars or planes or anything at this time. Everybody that wanted to go see where all this stuff happened and, you know, the years of the Crusades and all that as well, it's a dangerous place to go trek on a mule for nine months to get there. So the Templars were men that dedicated their life to, to providing safe passage to these people. You want to go see the Holy Land? We're going to make sure you don't get robbed and getting there. And to their credit, they invented like the first banking system. You'd go to a, a, a preceptory in France. You'd give them your silver. They would give you a codex with a, a code nobody could decipher. You would take that to Jerusalem and they would give you your silver. So it was a way of depositing money without having to carry it because you're going to get robbed, right? And uh, it later, and at first, that's all they were doing. And then later, I think it was the either the church or whatever, or the, I think it was the, the interim king of Jerusalem that made them like martial law. Like they're now the guardians and military to protect us and, you know, uh, help people reach Jerusalem, right? And then you have the Crusades and, you know, the, the Arabs wanted to overthrow. You have Saladin and everything else. And, uh, and then at that point, the Templars had built up quite a bit of wealth through donation, land, everything else. And to the point where the King of France was indebted to them quite a bit and uh, started accusing them of being heretics, you know, spitting on the cross, committing homosexual acts, all the things that would get you killed, you know, a thousand years ago. And uh, essentially they were, for the most part, all burned at the stake. You know, you have Jacques de Molay. He was the uh, the Grand Master at the time. He was burned in the public square. They rounded up all the other ones and and killed them too. So, um, so the idea of the Knights Templar is that from the building of Solomon's Temple, there were actual artifacts. And the cool thing about all this is it's not just a story. This is history. You can read three different religions, holy book. They're all going to tell you the same thing. So it's validation that this is a genuine lineage of men that died for secrets and, you know, did things that they knew might get them killed, but they did it for what they felt was right. So I think the harboring of quote unquote secrets, it comes from a time where if the king or the head of church knew you were chatting with people about new ways of doing politics, democracy, you know, things that didn't involve, you know, uh, um, a dictator essentially, or a pair of them, that that's a threat, right? They don't know how these people are going to get out. Hence the need to meet in silence. And if you want to talk about famous Freemasons, you've got George Washington, Benjamin Franklin, uh, Winston Churchill, um, Buzz Aldrin, Shaquille O'Neal is a, is a Freemason, you know? So um, there's a lot of people that have not ever shied away from being proud of this because of the lineage. I mean, there is no other club or fraternity or charitable association that's 2,500 years old that you can just join. It doesn't exist. But the problem is a lot of it has been misconstrued. And because of that, we don't talk. And historically, they really didn't talk, even until their frigging grave. That leads a lot of people to think, well, if you're not talking about it, you must be doing something bad. Why are you guys hiding? 
I mean, it's not really hiding when we wear rings and bumper stickers. And if you go on our website, it says the night of the meeting and the time and here's how to contact us. But people take that and media has taken that, you know, the whole Indiana Jones and um, Indiana Jones. what was it? Dan, Dan Brown, Dan Brown, the book? Dan Brown books. Yep. The cool thing about Dan Brown is he actually went to some of those places that have like Scottish Rite symbolism, you know, Rosslyn Chapel, the Louvre, Paris. I mean, basically what happened, if you believe the lore, the Templars went to Jerusalem went underneath Solomon's temple, took all the valuables out before they were confiscated and slowly moved them through Europe. As people got closer, they'd move them somewhere else and somewhere else. So that's why you have these massive shrines in like Malta and Italy and France and like Rosslyn Chapel in Scotland that's never held a mass. But yet it's this massive ornate building with all these Masonic carvings and like trap doors in the floor. And what were they hiding? And if you, you know, it's conjecture, but a lot of people will say, well, it's the Holy Grail. So here's what the Holy Grail is. It's one of four things. Holy Grail is either the Ark of the Covenant and the, and the Ten Commandments, either or. It's the chalice or the last cup at the Last Supper that supposedly Jesus drank out of. It's the belief that Mary Magdalene was Jesus's wife or the bloodline itself, their lineage is the Holy Grail. And nobody knows, including Masons and Knights Templar and guys that are above me. You know, I've chatted with some people that are so hell bent on you guys are Illuminati and you rule yeah. the world. And mm -hmm. I've told them, listen, I'm about as high as you can go, man. The guys at my meeting don't even remember to bring the sandwiches. There's not a chance in hell these 80 year old men, they can barely walk. OK, so stop reading the Internet. They're not devil worshiping. And in fact, one of the three things you have to believe as, a, as a, a candidate for masonry, 21 years old, good reputation, and belief in a supreme being. You don't have to profess a belief in a certain religion. You don't have to say what that looks like. You just have to believe that there is a creator and there's a reason to do good deeds to help people because that's the way I show my reverence and my thanks to that creator. So any religion, any race, any color can be a Freemason. The only people who cannot be a Freemason are legitimate through and through atheists. Don't believe in creation. This is all a fluke. No point in any of it. Well, then why do you want to go once a month and do charitable donations if you don't really think there's a purpose to that? So for that very reason, you have to believe in something. You have to believe that we're here to do good. And what we learned in our degrees, you know, if we increase our own value, our own humility, our own minds, that we increase the common stock of humanity, you know? I explained it to a friend one time and he's like, oh, it's kind of like if everyone did it, it would be a perfect world. I'm like, exactly. The problem is not everybody is doing it. And I don't want to live in a world where nobody is doing it. So I can't change your life. I need to mind my business and improve myself instead yes. of worrying about somebody else. And if everybody did that, we would be great. Problem is, 100%. <laughs> problem is we don't. So, no. you know, this was basically, and again, put it in its context. We're talking 2,500 years ago. This was a way of explaining great, important truths to people that were illiterate. And so it's like the Bible. People cut it up and down, left and right. It's a combination of stories that even if they didn't happen, it's trying to explain a moral lesson to somebody who can't understand it any other way, right? It, it's, it's allegory. Like mm -hmm. when you ask a Mason, what is Freemasonry? I what think our think? answer is it's a beautiful system of morality veiled in allegory and illustrated by symbols. So it's a, mm -hmm. it's a cool philosophy system, ritual, ancient history. Like if you're a science or history or philosophy person, it's for you for sure, because you're getting inside info to actual history, real names, real people that lived and what it's turned into now. And a lot of things we take for granted nowadays, even terms like black ball or, you know, meet a guy on the level, the number of people in a jury, the way you stand when you swear an oath on, at a trial. I won't repeat it, but that's called a do guard. And in the United States, they use that in the second degree. In Canada, we don't. There are some differences. So I think the confusion comes into play where that's what happened in masonry to make it masonry. You know, formalized Freemasonry as we know it, I think it's from like the 1700s, where guys put together a system of degrees using snippets of all of these stories to impart greater truths and to make it something people could partake in and absorb and all the rest. So 
and with that comes the structure of each lodge. So a lodge is set up the same way as King Solomon's temple. You have the master representing Solomon. They sit in the east. And then across from him, you have what's called a senior warden. There's a junior warden. Uh, there's a chaplain if it's a craft lodge. And then you have regular people that you would have at like a rotary club. You have a treasurer. You have a secretary. You might have like a director of ceremonies. And everybody uh, does something. So most Masonic meetings, the only thing that's ancient about it is the ceremony to open and close the lodge. The rest of the lodge meeting is like a rotary club meeting. Can I have the reading of the summons? Are there any errors or omissions? Great. Can we get the meetings from the, the minutes from the last meeting? Uh, does anyone have anything for the good of the fraternity? Uh, sick and visiting, meaning if you know somebody who's down and out, we'll send a card, flowers, assistance, whatever. Uh, propositions for membership, Masonic information. Some guy might read a paper. You know, here's the, the history of our apron. Why is it shared that way? Or why is it shaped that way? Or why do we have this mosaic tile on the floor? Like it's to, to, to grow your mind and learn a little bit more. And uh, the only time that there's anything that happens other than that is if it's a degree. You have a new initiate or a guy going from first to second or second to third, in which case all the members that are active officers in those chairs, they all have a role immediately. If you're that guy for that year, if you do a first degree, you're doing that lecture. So you got six months, you got to do it, you know, and, and you remember how it was when you went through. And even if you stumble, you don't care because you want it to be impressionable for that, that person, right? Like when I went through my first degree and it took a blindfold off and there's 50 total strangers there just like smiling and welcoming me and then like congratulating me after the fact, like, I was like, man, they showed up just for me. And when I did my Scottish right, I remember I held the door open for like an 80 year old man one time. And he, I'm like, after you, sir. And he stopped dead in his tracks and turned around and he goes, listen, I am not your sir. I'm your brother. And you better remember that. And I was just mm -hmm. like, yes, sir. I mean, brother, you know, like it, it was oh. too important to me that there is nobody greater than anybody else. He might have been a Mason for 60 friggin' years. Doesn't matter. You know, the point is we're all the same. We're all equal. We treat each other the same way and you need to treat other people the same way or, or you're not getting it, you know? So what I can say to people that are thinking of being a Mason, if you think you're going to sell more life insurance, make conne business connections, make money, you're going to waste your time. Not a single person in any Masonic body anywhere in the world has ever made a penny ever. And I know there's a lot of like, oh, judges in England and police and all this. It's conjecture. There's good and bad in everything. There's bad apples, but it's not. If we had somebody in our lodge for that purpose, it would be insulting to us. We're in this to improve our own morals and our own thinking. If you're here to try to sell more cars, get out. Like, I don't want to be your friend, you know, and it's not about that. In fact, the only person I ever knew that made money was the lady that answered the phone at the Grand Lodge. Because that's a job for her. She was like a librarian and the receptionist. Yeah, she got paid. But everybody yeah. else does this just for the love of doing it. It's survived 2,500 years. My concern now is it's dying out because the old guys are old. It's inevitable. Yeah. And uh, if young guys don't know what it's about and know that it's pretty cool, and if you're into this stuff, you're really going to dig it, uh, we're not going to have any members. you know. So that's why I'm here today. No, and it's good. It's good that you're coming out and talking about it because you know some people don't want to talk about it. They'll say, "Yeah, I'm a Mason," but they they don't really want to share about it. And what we've learned so far is like it doesn't. There's nothing evil sounding going on. There's no like weirdness going on. You've gone through the ceremonies, which explain, you know, which explains that and takes the mystery out of it. That's why I wanted to call this episode demystifying because we can show what it is in a grounded way. Because there is a ton of conspiracies out there. Like, oh, this person's a Mason and all the Masons work together in some sort of massive conspiracy. So there is a cabal of Illuminati, whether they call themselves that or not. But the things people fear, that exists. It's just not in the Masonic world. There are people like the Rockefellers and Rothschild and all that nonsense. Like, that's legit. There are people... I mean, look at every drop of oil in the planet is controlled by seven companies, OPEC, right? right? They exist. Those clicks are there. We all know that 1% of people have 99% of the money, but that has nothing to do with Freemasonry. So, but again, the, the reason is because of the secrecy 
And, you know, people are like, well, why are you keeping it secret? The only thing nowadays Masons consider secret is the modes of recognition of another Mason. What is, the, how do you identify yourself as yeah. a Mason? And it's not any one thing. So like I could chat with a guy for 30 seconds. I can tell you if he's a Mason or not. And really? I can tell if he's full of it, hundred percent. Really? Just like I got busted in 15 seconds when that old man's like, why are you wearing that ring? Well, you the ring on, right? Oh yeah, no, it's uh, yeah. And then he ripped my head off. Right. I could tell instantly. Like first question usually is, you know, what lodge do you belong to? Oh yeah. You know, who's your grandmaster? What did you guys do last meeting? Stuff like that. Like a lot of it is trick questions. And do you travel East? If you don't know how to answer, you're going to look stupid, you know? So, so they and, ask, that's one of the things they ask you, do you travel East? Yeah. That's the thing that guys used to do years ago to find out if you were a Mason, because in the Masonic lodge, you're always facing East, all the actions happening yeah, up there. Like, huh? And the East is the center of knowledge, right? Like Mecca, they always pray to the East. That, that Holy land is not just claimed by one or two religions. It's three or four religions, right? Like uh, even if you include like Zoroastrians and the Jains and all the rest, right? So there's a lot of people that, the Holy Land is their Holy Land. Their story comes from there. There's something about that place. Even UFOs. There was a UFO over the the, the Dome of the Rock. And it I just, yeah, very popular video, right? So we always face the East out of reverence. That's where Solomon's Temple was. And uh, yeah, and every Masonic body is set up a similar way. The names of the characters change. So you go from like, uh, you know, uh, Junior Warden, to like a sojourner kind of thing, principal sojourner. Um, you know, like you'll have first principal, second principal, third principal. Um, yeah, and they're all basically set up the same way. So there's two ways you can advance in masonry. One is by doing each role in a different chair every year. So you might be the guy standing outside the door one year as the outer guard. Next year, you might be the guy that like holds the flag. The year after that, you might have a decent part in like an initiation ceremony until you get to the three main chairs, which are junior warden, senior warden, and then master. So minimum, you're looking four or five years before you can be the master of a lodge. And the reason for that is because you you've memorized all those lectures when you were in each of those chairs. Now you're the master. And in the book, most of the parts are yours. Now, in reality, most lodges will divvy that out. They'll have an old guy who memorized that lecture and does it like amazing and you'll call on those guys like, hey, we're doing a first degree next month. Can you do the working tools lecture? Yeah, yeah, I'll get it brushed up. And they always begrudgingly do it. And then they come in and just ace it. And it's like, this guy doesn't remember where he put his car keys, but he knows that thing word for word. It's unbelievable, right? And the point is, is to impart that special um, uh, feeling when the next guy's going through, you know, you see them, they don't know. They're just like, you know, they're looking around and they're, they're the same way you were but you feel good because you know he's going to eventually get what he's looking for, right? We're all seeking light and light for everyone is different, you know? And as I mentioned, the first degree is your birth. Second degree is your adulthood. Third degree is death and come into grips wow. with that. And we can talk more about that after the break. Yeah. So let's, let's take our break real quick here. So stay tuned. We'll be back with more with Louis Borges. We are talking about Freemasonry and Knights Templar. Thank you guys in the chat. And we're going to talk more with Lou. When we come back too, we're going to start taking some of your questions. So don't go anywhere. Oh, I need to put that in. No, no, I know I'm taking the break phone. My name is Alex Exum, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. Musicians experience a lot of frustration with music marketing and promotion. They have no idea how to get their music heard, and they're spending hours sending emails, making phone calls, and hitting up their friends to promote them. With our industry-powered digital marketing platform, we can set up your media plan in minutes. Our team will automatically distribute your music across all the best channels, so you can focus on actually making the music. Submit your music today on our website at mymusicpromoter.com. That's mymusicpromoter.com. 
Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? You'll love the new Paranormal Radio app from Talk Stream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk Entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. What are you doing late nights? Join me, Jess Rogie, the host of The Jess Rogie Show. We have a new show title and a new time slot. Become part of the show by calling in and joining in on the conversation. We'll discuss a wide variety of topics, including everything from consciousness, conspiracies, current events, fringe topics, pop culture, and so much more. Let's see where the night takes us. Join us live five nights a week, Monday through Friday at 11 p.m. Pacific, 2 a.m. Eastern. Right after Lighting the Void with Joe Roop on KTLK Digital Broadcasting, The Fringe FM. Listen, as we explore the mysteries of the universe, the unknown, high strangeness, consciousness, and our human potential, Lighting the Void is an eclectic program that strives to ignite the late night with stimulating conversations. Join us on The Fringe FM. Tired of talking about the weather? No shift. Well, Shift Happens is here to fulfill your desires. As you reach that point in life where you crave tantalizing conversation about reality, ufology, the occult, and the conspiracies within, while simultaneously finding yourself desperately in need of your very own theme music, which we've got plenty of that too. So be sure to tune in to Shift Happens every Friday night from 7 to 9 Pacific, right here on The Fringe FM. Because the weather sucks, and you need some theme music. If you suffered in silence or experienced stress from a paranormal experience, even if it happened 20 years ago, when thinking or talking about it today still makes you feel sick to your stomach or makes your heart beat faster, or you suddenly can't breathe, maybe you even feel those old familiar signs of a panic attack trying to reach the surface. You could have unprocessed emotional responses. Those reactions of terror and trauma are no different than living through a horrible assault, childhood abuse, or a terrible car accident. It can be nearly impossible to find help. The very instance of seeing a ghost or encountering a cryptid could be clinically described as seeing or hearing things that aren't there. You could be considered psychotic, or at best, you're just not taken seriously. Out of a growing mountain of research, the National Institute for Integrative Healthcare showed that eight out of 10 veterans who completed just six one-hour EFT sessions no longer tested positive for PTSD. If you've had paranormal trauma, you can contact Metaphorical Archaeology by calling 214-995-3754. Again, that's 214-995-3754 for a discreet consultation. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back live on KTLK Digital Broadcasting, the Fringe FM. is the Jess Rogie show tonight we got Louis Borges we're talking about Freemasonry and the Knights Templar I give a shout out to Michael Strange troubled minds in the chat Michael Strange is live every Monday through Friday 7 p.m. Pacific right here on the Fringe FM he starts off the Fringe FM late night so let's get Louis back on here oh let me do this boom there we go oh that was slick this time I'm getting better at all this. Like, I'm like, click, 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 play the video, put the little. See, uh, I have my studio padding set up for our UAP studies podcast. So our frames are a certain size. And I didn't <laughs> want to do this in the entire room here because I'd still be doing it a year and a half into it. 
you'd still be cutting the foam and oh, placing yeah. the foam on the wall. It's a lot, sure. of work, a lot of work. So it's good that we can crop it like this. So Louie doesn't have all this, this, this wall nothing else here. Like this was actually a sewing room from the previous owner. So it's a, oh, nice. it's a big rectangle with a bunch of cupboards and like there's an ironing board in here that like there's a door that opens, it folds out. There's all these rollers for things. I've turned it into a podcast room. So I have like obviously the mic. I have like right now I have all my regalia over here. I can show you guys whatever you want to see. And what do you got to, too? What's that? Show show us some stuff. We'd like okay. To so I showed you what a craft lodge apron looks like, a third degree. So I mentioned that yes. when you go above that, there's two ways. You have a Scottish right and a York right. So standard regalia in a Masonic Lodge is a suit and tie with that blue apron. If you're one of the officers, you'll have like the same color blue, be like a shoulder cover with like a jewel in the front. And each officer has a different symbol as their jewel. The master has the Masonic logo, which I showed earlier, the square and compass with the sun in it. Um, the sun is very important. You know, it represents, you know, knowledge and strength. Even going back to the Egyptians, the sun's been important and it still yeah. is just because of the age of this fraternity, right? Um, and then, so in a Scottish rite, uh, it's a black tuxedo, black tie, and you wear this. This is your jewel here. Okay. So, so you'd have one of these over, over your black tux. And basically, I don't know if you can see that. Okay. And what it's is the symbol? So it's a, it's a, I believe they call it a Teutonic cross, and it has a number 32 in the middle with an acacia leaf around it, acacia wreath. Symbolizing like Hiram Abiff and all the rest. There's some other things in there too, but but that's a, a 32 degree. Now there is a 33rd degree. A lot of people talk about this. Yeah, so that's, 33rd, there's a lot of mystery. Yeah, 33rd degree you cannot attain on your own merits. Uh, in fact, if you ever ask to be considered for a 33rd degree, you're disqualified for life. 33rd degree is like a lifetime service award. It's uh, voted on by your peers within the Scottish Rite body, and uh, I think they call it the consistory. And if the consistory decides that you're like all for it, always been helpful, you've been doing this, committed, they'll 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 give you this honorary 33rd degree. So then you go from black tux, black tie to a white tie. And instead of that being red and yellow, this becomes you get the same gold on the outside, but you have white on the inside and a different jewel. It's uh, so that and there's very few 33rd degrees. They also get a different ring to wear. Uh, speaking of ring placement. A true yes. Mason will never wear his ring on his left hand. You're never married to your lodge. That is wrong. You're married to your, your partner, and then it's your career and your and your religion and whatever or whatever you believe. Then it's your Masonic Lodge. So right hand, ring finger. There's a lot of debate on do you wear it with like the way you read the symbol with the points yeah, like down, or do you wear it upside down with the points up? There, and I know I have some very educated, brilliant speakers in this topic. There is nowhere in anybody's ritual that says how you're supposed to wear the ring. But some guys will say, no, you have to keep them concealed, uh, meaning upside down. I wear mine facing people so they recognize the symbol and ask me about it. And that's why I do that. Um, I don't wear it during the summer months when we're, we're in darkness, so to speak. There's no meetings, typically because most people go away in the summer and to conduct a legal meeting, you have to have a certain number of members. You can't vote or pass any kind of ballots or anything unless you have enough people. Uh, and, and that number varies depending on which body you're talking about. So, so that's Scottish, right? The other way is York, right? So York, right? Instead of that white and sort of teal apron, York, right? Becomes one of these Royal Arch apron. So you have what's called a triple towel, which is like a three-sided symbol. Sorry, everything's reversed on the screen. You still have yeah. the same tassels. You still have the same flap. So you wear this with a sash. And this is only if you're like a full-fledged Royal Arch Mason. You've had all your degrees. So essentially, you have your, your sash on there. This little jewel is emblematic of something. And I also have a breast medal I wear, which I didn't bring down. It's still upstairs. But it signifies that I'm what's called a past first principle, meaning... For one particular year, I ran that entire body. I went through all the chairs, was elected, and then I was like the master for the year. So as a, as a, a remembrance of that, you get a breast medal, even in a regular lodge. So when you greet a guy or see a guy you don't know, you can tell by his regalia what he's done. If I was a member of like the Royal Arch Conclave of my province, this would change. These colors would be different. My apron would be different. 
there would be gilding and tassels around it. There would be a logo here. So if I was like a grand standard bearer, I would have that insignia of the standard bearer. If I was the grand steward or, you know, the grand Zerubbabel or the grand first for like a huge number of men, your regalia changes again. So a lot of times it's very subtle things. And when you see a guy just decked out, you know that that's yeah. like 40 years of service, right? Like, um, and then again, there's another branch, like you mentioned in the bio, cryptic, right? So cryptic, yeah. right? Focuses on, it's just a couple short degrees. You have to already be a Royal Arch Mason before you can join the cryptic, but it kind of elaborates on the story of what did they find when they dug under the temple in the crypt and uh, cryptic, right? There's lots of symbology with a triangle. I won't get into why, but you can easily find that if you look online. Okay. But uh, triangle, everything in threes. A lot of religions have threes, trinity, unity. You know, mm -hmm. three seems to have, you know, interstellar ramifications. So that's why the triple tau, it's three little things. And then, uh, so a cryptic right apron is actually a triangular apron. And you have a triangle with a trowel in the middle symbolizing the digging. And, uh, and if you are an officer in this lodge... Your, your, your collar would be the same color. And, um, you know, whenever you get, um, is this it here? No, this is something else. Yeah. So, okay. So that's, that's the cryptic, right? Now you want to be a Knights Templar. You can yeah. be a Knights Templar, I believe, without the cryptic, right? But you have to have the York right first. And it's a series of three degrees. The first one is the Knight of the Red Cross. Basically explains the story of these original Templars were providing medical aid. Uh, for free, the Knights Hospitaller, they were originally called. So it is, if I could show you here. So basically, you have a, a headdress and you wear a sort of like a green robe. And I have, a, I have a reusable one here because I do different degrees and different portrayals. But essentially, your hat looks like that, the Knight of the Red Cross. Okay, interesting. Okay. Interesting. And then from that, the degree after the Red Cross is Knights of Malta. So your headdress turns into that, which is the Maltese cross. You have black robes, black aprons. And then from there, because there is some significance to the whole Malta and, and everything else in, in like military terms. And then from there, you become a full-fledged Knight Templar. So I'll, I'll grab the regalia here. I'm just going to do this without dropping it on the floor. So... And again, we are we're operative, right? Just like we're not stone masons anymore. We're we're like yeah. figurative masons. So all this stuff is meant to be adapted for like morality and all that kind of stuff, right? So you wear a blazer. This is actually a military blazer. I was supposed to get a double-breasted coat with Masonic buttons. And for the price of it, I went to a, a UK uniform company. This is actually a naval officer's uniform. I don't know if you could see it. Has all these weird numbers and stuff in it. Yeah, I see all that. Yeah, but yeah. So I'll put it on and show you here because it's a it's like a four stage thing. So the, the dress in this case is this double breasted suit. You wear uh, you wear like a black tie that has like a um, uh, the Templar crosses on it. I'll just do this up quickly here. There we go. So you have that. If you look at the um, the Queen's husband, Philip. Yeah, or yeah. the sun, they have massive ones of these, two of them, because they're the head of the Knights Templar in England, right? So you uh, wear that on top of that. Oh, but before you put on your, your sash or your mantle, you have to have your cross, or sorry, your sword. So this, oh, wow. is a, uh, this is a ceremonial sword. It's not actually sharp on the edges, but it is pointy, so you could probably take out some frogs if you really wanted to. Yeah, if you want to poke somebody. <laughs> yeah, and depending if you're right or left-handed, it goes on the either the right side or left side. And in fact, the handshake that we know of, it comes from the days of riding on a horse, having your weapon. So your right hand usually was used to draw your sword. So the extension of the right hand shows, I mean, you no harm. I come in peace because here's my weapon hand. I can't get you, right? That's where the handshake comes from. So in my case, it goes on the left side because I'm right-handed. So you have that. And then you have... This is what everybody uh, goes through all these degrees for, is to get one of these, which I will show you real quick. Of course, I tie it in a knot before I put it on the hanger like an idiot. But <laughs> So this is a proper Templar. It's called a mantle. Wow. So you have your Templar. I'll move the mic over. You got your Templar cross, and uh, this just goes around you. There's no sleeves or anything in it. It's basically just uh, just a robe. 
and we'll get our own straight here. There's a certain way you tie your knot. I forget actually, but I think I'm pretty close. You do like a double over and then you do kind of like a half and then another half. So you have that and then you have your cap. So when you're first initiated, it's just a red cap. Yeah. And then if you become an officer or like a high priest, then you become that. So technically, I'm supposed to have these on my uh, on my arms right now. I just haven't sewed them on. So, and uh, and basically, if you become like the master of the Knights Templar Lodge, then you get to get a double strike. And you'll see a lot of that in Masonic symbolism. I don't think my ring's got it, but basically, when you see the cross with two lines, it, yeah. it symbolizes guys that. Like the Templars had a, a pact that if one man was injured and couldn't ride his horse, that you would you would pick him up and he would have to ride on your horse. So the two crosses on the stick symbolize one horse and two men, like oh, no man nice. left standing. Right. And that's kind of the um, so as a symbol of, again, your rank as you go through these different offices, your insignia changes. Like if I was the uh, the head preceptor for the year, I would have like a red stripe. I've seen guys with two red stripes. I've seen guys that have like, like a certain jewel that goes on their neck where it says like, um, uh, I think it was KST or something. It was like the night. Uh, it's like an honorary thing. Like you're the, you're the, the chief, you know, of Canada or whatever. Right. Like you, yeah. it's another thing that's been given to you based on your merits. You know what I mean? So, so this is Knights Templar garb. Uh, and then I was invited after a couple of years of being a Templar and really being involved and this thing was basically um, for guys who have shown exemplary conduct, really gone out of their way. So I got like a cryptic letter in the mail, you know, like you've been elected by your peers to do the following. And it's called the, uh, the Red Cross of Constantine. And there's only, I think, 27 members at a time that can be in any one particular chapter. And it's quite an honor to be invited. It's kind of like, you know, we've noticed you and we want you to kind of be, be on the inside, be on our team. And, uh, and this is the insignia for that. So it's a, it's a scarlet colored uh, thing. And then you have those letters. So I H S V sorry, it's really hard to do this. I got you. Here we go. There we go. So in hoc sinuinces. So it means in this symbol, I will defend. And it's referring to like the Templar cross, but emblematically it's referring to what is right versus what is wrong. Have you seen the movie Kingdom of Heaven with Liam Neeson yeah. and Orlando mm -hmm. Bloom? That whole ceremony of him kneeling, these guys standing around him in white robes, you know, uh, they read the oath. You will defend, you know, the innocent, even if it costs your death. You will never, you know, all those things. That is your oath. Then they slap him across the face and say, and that is so you'll remember it. So it's similar to that. I won't give it away. Again, you they can slap, look it up. Do they slap you, Louie? No, not hard. <laughs> They'll tap you to remind you. They still complete that part of the ceremony, but it's like, <laughs> this is so you'll remember your oath. They don't. No, they, Back in the day, 150 probably, years ago, oh, yeah, they rip your head off. They probably, like, wound up and slapped really good. Yeah. And, in fact, even in the third degree of masonry, you're, you're representing somebody who's trying to gain admission, but the guy at the door doesn't buy your story. So they grab you and accost you. And some guys I've, I've heard back in the day, they roughed them up. They scared the hell out of the guy going through it. Now they don't do that. I mean, you can barely get people to join. We're not going to scare them out the bloody door because, you know, <laughs> our ceremony got out of hand. But I, I remember my lodge would cross uh, Erie, Pennsylvania and go to Philadelphia, which is like the city of brotherly love, meaning Masonic traditions. And they would actually portray a degree for because and there are some differences in the actual ritual i mean yeah. in canada there's four or five in the states there's a couple um and so yeah they would go down and it would be all guys that are really good at each part and one guy would have to be the candidate and he's like we're gonna throw you around man but at least he knew what's coming because he's already been through it he's going down there to be the acting crew you know but uh but yeah and um even in terms of like how they do business so um, like in Canada, when you're a first degree, just an entered apprentice, you can go to the meetings until you get, they usually take you a couple of months to go all the way through, depending on how fast you want to go and how able the lodge is to assemble the right people to do the ceremony. But in the States, for the most part, they don't do any business unless it's in the master Mason degree. 
So that means a, an initiated Mason can attend a meeting. And I kind of like it the way I went through because as soon as I went through my thing, they put me in what's called the Northeast angle. And to this day, the Northeast corner, is it Northeast? Yeah, Northeast. There is the first stone, the keystone laid on every major building. It's just that a tradition, superstition, whatever. But it, it, it symbolizes the fact that that was the first stone. You're now placed in that seat and everybody's away from, like they're all going around in a big circle. And it, it symbolizes the fact that you are just as important as every other person here. In fact, you're the most important right now because you are that cornerstone. And if you're not solid, all these guys above you will crumble. So every block from the top block to the very bottom block is equally important and has a value. And you've now been entrusted with that value. So conduct yourself wisely, right? Like it wasn't easy to go through this for yourself. You had to pass a lot of tests and have a lot of faith. Now that you've arrived, this is what your expectations are. You could never not help a fellow man in distress. You've taken an oath. If I can help, I will. And that becomes your, uh, you've taken, you take an oath on your morals, not on your life, you know, and that's worse, okay. you know? How has it changed your life? Like from when you, before you were a Mason and, and now? I didn't know there was such a thing. Like, I didn't know that there was just like the philosophy club with all these guys that were, four times my age and I could have a conversation with them. We like the same things. We joke at the same or laugh at the same jokes. It didn't feel that different. And it was just reassuring like, okay, at least somebody is trying to be decent and trying to do things. And it, like my first meeting, when I was initiated, I sat down, they ran the normal business meeting, right? They opened the lodge, did their usual business, did the degree. And now they're finishing off with like sick and visiting in the last sections of the business part. And it was December 7th, 07, and they were running a committee that was going to donate Christmas dinners to people that had recently lost jobs. There was a big factory in this town that went under. It was Black and Decker. And a lot of people that were way too proud to ask. Like, these were regular middle-class people. They don't have a job. And some of them had, like, four kids. And, you know, things were tight. And they would never ask for help. And so random members would, like, petition names. And uh, Canada Post would deliver this package for free on Christmas Eve. And it's from Anonymous. And I quickly learned that every single donation has never been claimed from us. And the reason for that is true charity means you don't know who's getting it and they don't know where it's coming from. Otherwise, you're doing it for yourself. You know, so for me, my very first meeting to realize that this is what these guys were planning yeah, I'm all for it. We're going to help some people that can't afford Christmas dinner. That's my first plan of, of, you know, action. I'm on these guys' team. I'm hooked. Whatever you need, you call me. And then a few months later, I got a call from um, one of the guys that was, you know, he was playing a big role. I think he was like the master of the lodge that year. And he goes, uh, what are you doing next Sunday? I said, nothing. He's like, uh, do you want to go to the Shriners Hospital in Montreal? And help cheer up some kids. I said, yeah. He's like, do you have any skills? I'm like, yeah, I do magic tricks and cards and stuff. He's like, okay. So he's like, come over to the house at this time. So I show up and uh, the guy's wife opens the door and she goes, yeah, yeah, grab a seat. I'm going to go grab the makeup. Like, what are you talking about? Oh. She's like, oh, haven't you seen the boys? I look in the living room and they're all like full clown with squeaky <laughs> horns and big shoes and laughing and waving at me. And they're like, this is how we go and cheer up kids we're Shriners. We're, you know, and, and to clarify every yeah. single Shriner on the planet, you know, the Shriners like Homer Simpson, yeah. had, they wear the red hat. The hat yeah. They drive the little cars, very big on children's charities. And they have a hospital network around the world where people that can't afford healthcare, get it paid for free. They'll move wow. your family there. They'll cover your bills. They take care of you. And it's totally private funded from the Shriners and the Masonic Lodge. There's no government money. There's none of that. And in fact, the Shriners Hospital in uh, L.A. or in California a few years ago, maybe more than that, maybe like 10 years ago, they had built a whole bunch and they couldn't complete it and because they didn't have any money to do it. And somebody anonymously dropped off $10 million and basically, basically told the secretary that I was a kid. I had brittle bone disease. I went to a Shriners Hospital. They made it not so scary and I want to give back and didn't want any credit for it. Right. So. When you put that stuff out there, that stuff comes back to you. So long story short, I got dressed up like a clown. We ripped down the highway. People are honking at us. And I got into it in about five minutes. I was like, this is cool. When you lose your humility all of a sudden, I guess we're doing this. I look at myself and she did such a good job. I looked amazing as a clown, you know? 
<laughs> and uh, then you get to the hospital and everything changes and you see kids with three months to live and uh, kids that have been in fires and their ears are melted off. Kids that can't speak, uh, kids with cancer, kids that have had brittle bone disease, 30 operations. You know, if they move the wrong way in bed, they break their hip. And uh, yeah, I even get a little emotional now talking about it because I didn't expect that. You don't, you know, you live in a bubble, you know, where we're all into like philosophy and how do we better ourselves and all this. None of that matters if you have three months to live and you're a nine year old boy or girl, you know? So it really puts into perspective what's important and it's not it's not what you do it's how you do it you know it's not what you think it's how you think and the only thing you can do in your life is affect change in yourself don't worry and stop trying to fix other people it ain't gonna happen they need to fix themselves even if people have substance abuse until they realize hey i got a problem doesn't matter their family could leave them their friends could tell them they're nuts they don't see it until they see it and it's the same thing. So if, like my friend said, it's kind of like, hey, if everyone did this, it'd be a perfect world. Exactly. But we know it's not. So some of us want to do that. And at the end of the day, I, you know, my apron will still be, uh, still be clean and white. And if I could be a good example for other people and, and uh, affect some small change, even if it is doing pancakes at the fire hall or running a barbecue for cystic fibrosis, tell me what you need. If that's what it's for, that's what I'm for. No, well, that's awesome. I mean, basically, you've taken it. Oh, no, we got a sorry, we got a bot. Can somebody get that bot in the chat, please? Is it no, free girl chat? Yeah, I mean, if unless like, oh, free girls chat, <sighs> horrible. How would somebody even click that? Like, that's not a link. There's no even link. If you were into that, where would you go? You're like, cool. You're supposed, to, you're supposed to go to girls18xyz. Yeah, but is that a website? I don't know. Well, I don't think anything ends in dot xyz. It's not a com. No. Like, how would you yeah. even? How, like, how is this bot win? What is it trying to do? I I, I don't know because what are you clicking on? It's like exactly. these virtual girls free. It's not like a link where it's like, hey, click here for sexy good times, you know, in yeah, broken it's, English. It's horrible. Okay, thank you, David. David, check it out. <laughs> Atta boy, David. Thank you, David. I don't know how you get rid of that bot. Can you just like report them or boot them? How does that work? <laughs> oh uh, shit! You, there it is again. <laughs> yeah, you have to go. You have to have somebody go uh, because I don't have the YouTube chat open. So somebody, one of my mods, has to take it out. No, Michael okay. Strange says, "Why don't we just pull it up and let's see?" I don't want to. I don't want to type that in and don't see. click that, man. Your computer will never be the same again. <laughs> you get more <laughs> pop ups than your motherboard could handle. No, I don't want to do that. So we do have a question from Michael. Michael says, "How do they fund Freemasons, lodges, etc." Yeah. So we all pay dues depending on how many bodies. In fact, I used to belong to like eight different bodies. I had to kind of tone it down a bit because, you know, one is 120 bucks a year. One's a hundred, one's 80, one's 50, but essentially it's all the members dues that basically cover like the building, the electricity, all that stuff. And then we do fundraising. And I was actually a member of one of the financial committees in my craft lodge back in Ontario and uh, I was like, I had to sign off on the report that goes to the Grand Lodge. And literally every single penny that was raised, money in was money out. It was like dollar for dollar. It was the easiest thing in the world. Opening balance zero. Here's all the donations. Here's all the fundraising. All the money went out. Closing balance zero. So there's no retained holdings. This is not a for-profit thing. This is we do what we do so that we can give back to the community. And every every body of masonry has its own like things they give to. So like my craft lodge would do um, more like community stuff, like mm -hmm. raising money for like the fire hall or like, uh, you know, care home, things like that, student grants, bursaries. And then the Scottish Rite was for diseases that affected the mind. So like dyslexia, people that were born, you know, I think they used to call it deaf and dumb. I don't think that's the right term. They're not dumb. They just can't speak. And I actually went to a conference once and it was a kid that went through rehabilitation school paid for by the Scottish Rite, born unable to speak. And this kid rifled off a 90 minute speech and there wasn't a dry eye in the house, you know, like phenomenal what that was for. Uh, the Royal Arch uh, in British Columbia here, they have the Royal Arch um, home. So it's a nursing home that's paid for by them. Um, not everybody's pension covers the cost of long term care nowadays. What do you do if you can't afford it? You're going to live on the street when you're 90, right? So oh, wow. it's for that. And the Shriners do a lot with uh, Children's Hospital. In fact, they're exclusively for the Shriners Hospital. So I know there's one in Canada. There's quite a few in the States. 
And, uh, and I mean, when big economic things happen, it affects them too, because they've all the donations, as long as they've been getting them have gone into a bursary or like a, a fund and the interest is what's donated. Well, when the funds drop and the uh, stock market takes a tumble, like their thing was cut in half. I think in 08, when the market crashed, they had like yeah. a $4 billion reserve and it went down to like one and a half billion. Just that's like a hundred years worth of donations from all over the planet, you know? So it, it greatly impacted the amount of money they could donate uh, to these causes, right? So, wow. Yeah, so that's, that's how they're that. funded. It's from members. It's from members. Members pay for our expenses. Our dues cover our own expense. Nothing from the charitable donations covers us. We take care of us. And then we run these campaigns. And again, too, like a lot of guys get involved as an officer, they'll head up one of these, you know, small events or bigger events. You can do as much or as little as you want. But for a lot of guys, you know, they weren't good at public speaking. Now they are. They weren't good at managing or like being a team leader. Now they are. So, um, you know, there's youth Masonic, uh, like Demole and things like that for young men to teach them confidence and keep them out of drugs and gangs and all that stuff and teach them to dress up once a month and you wear regalia and you learn some moral significance and that kind of thing. We, uh, I'm sorry to have to interrupt you, but we have to take our last. No, I noticed we're two minutes past break. We're two minutes past break, but that's okay. You're on a roll. So stay tuned, everybody. We'll be right back with more with Louie. Drop your questions in the chat. I see some coming in. So drop them, guys, and we'll be right back live here on KTLK Digital Broadcasting, the Fringe FM. Stay tuned and don't you guys go anywhere. I'm going to try to make this a quick break. My name is Alex Exum, and you're listening to The Fringe FM. Musicians experience a lot of frustration with music marketing and promotion. They have no idea how to get their music heard, and they're spending hours sending emails, making phone calls, and hitting up their friends to promote them. With our industry-powered digital marketing platform, we can set up your media plan in minutes. Our team will automatically distribute your music across all the best channels, so you can focus on actually making the music. Submit your music today on our website at mymusicpromoter.com. That's mymusicpromoter.com. Are you intrigued by Paranormal Talk Radio? you love the new Paranormal Radio app from TalkStream Live. You'll find a great selection of talk shows covering UFOs, ghosts, strange phenomena, and much more. Download the Paranormal Radio app now and start listening to the very best in Paranormal Talk entertainment, including the network you're listening to right now. The Paranormal Radio app, free in Google Play and the iOS App Store. What are you doing late nights? Join me, Jess Rogie, the host of The Jess Rogie Show. We have a new show title and a new time slot. Become part of the show by calling in and joining in on the conversation. We'll discuss a wide variety of topics, including everything from consciousness, conspiracies, current events, fringe topics, pop culture, and so much more. Let's see where the night takes us. Join us live five nights a week, Monday through Friday at 11 p.m. Pacific, 2 a.m. Eastern. Right after Lighting the Void with Joe Roop on KTLK Digital Broadcasting, The Fringe FM. Listen, as we explore the mysteries of the universe, the unknown, high strangeness, consciousness, and our human potential, Lighting the Void is an eclectic program that strives to ignite the late night with stimulating conversations. Join us on The Fringe FM. Tired of talking about the weather? No shift. Well, Shift Happens is here to fulfill your desires. As you reach that point in life where you crave tantalizing conversation about reality, ufology, 
the occult, and the conspiracies within, while simultaneously finding yourself desperately in need of your very own theme music, which we've got plenty of that too. So be sure to tune in. The shift happens every Friday night from 7 to 9 Pacific, right here on the Fringe FM. Because the weather sucks, and you need some theme music. If you suffered in silence or experienced stress from a paranormal experience, even if it happened 20 years ago, when thinking or talking about it today still makes you feel sick to your stomach or makes your heart beat faster or you suddenly can't breathe, maybe you even feel those old familiar signs of a panic attack trying to reach the surface. You could have unprocessed emotional responses. Those reactions of terror and trauma are no different than living through a horrible assault, childhood abuse, or a terrible car accident. It can be nearly impossible to find help. The very instance of seeing a ghost or encountering a cryptid could be clear clinically described as seeing or hearing things that aren't there. You could be considered psychotic, or at best, you're just not taken seriously. Out of a growing mountain of research, the National Institute for Integrative Healthcare showed that 8 out of 10 veterans who completed just 6 one-hour EFT sessions no longer tested positive for PTSD. If you've had paranormal trauma, you can contact Metaphorical Archaeology by calling 214-995-3754. Again, that's 214-995-3754 for a discreet consultation. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are back live on the Fringe FM. I'm Jess Rogie, and I'm going to bring Louie on just so we can get this party started because we have not much time left and we're getting questions. So welcome back, Louie. Welcome All right, back. let's do some questions. Okay, so let's just let's just go. Let's just go. Let's start here. Cool music, by the way. Thank you, thank you. Set the tone a little bit. This is so turning into a, that was probably going to be a clip later, right there. Uh. <laughs> Little head bob on the rogues. Yep. So Sylvain says, "What is the main focus of Freemasonry?" So if you look at any Masonic Lodge website, it'll say making good men better. And uh, it is predominantly male. There are female Masonic bodies, the Ladies of the Eastern Star, Job's Daughters. Um, You know, we a lot of times will sort of amalgamate on projects. And I mentioned before the show we were chatting, I said, if if they're doing the catering and we're doing the silent auction and we go in the kitchen, they will rip our head off because that is their domain. They do their meetings. The husbands drop them off. If they linger, it's like, hey, shoo, shoo. You have your once a month, so do we. So, and there are actual women Freemasons. Now, if you go to any Masonic forum on Facebook, man, you get ripped apart. There's a lot of old school guys. No, women don't belong and this and that. And I think that comes from a place of they've been married 60 years. They get one (laughs) night a month. They want to hang out with their buddies. These guys aren't at the bar at 80, right? So they want to have something for them that's important to them, but it's not to detract from women at all. And women do have their own... Um, there are women Freemasons and there are women in Masonic bodies as well. Well, that's interesting. Cause I thought that women were not allowed to be in it. So that that's 400 insane. years ago. Yeah. But 400 years ago, people were blatant racist too, right? It's not an apology for like, you know, or it's <laughs> not a, it doesn't make it right, but that's just how it was. I mean, this, uh, at one point, hundreds of years ago, blacks weren't allowed to be a part, which is ridiculous. And they formed the Prince hall of Freemasonry, which was all black Masons. Now, they meet at each other's lodges. I have half of my lodge was African American, Asian, East Indian, because oh, it's ever- it, it, it spreads every race, every religion. If you're a Jew, whatever it takes to be a good Jew is the same values you need to be a Freemason. It's not meant to, you know, uh, interfere with your life or your family or any of that. It's all conducive. I mean, think about it. Every religion believes the same thing. No religion says you can murder or commit adultery or steal. So the same basic tenets that you profess as a Mason are not, you know, inconducive with your, your religious or your moral beliefs existing. Thank you. Thank you. So Vince says, is there, what is the relationship between Freemason? I don't know. In my lodge back home, I had three cops in there and one's dad was like the chief of police and stuff. I don't know. It's because there's a certain military aspect of it. It's very like regimented. Mm -hmm. You walk a certain way, dress up. 
I know a lot of wartime guys, and I think it's just from their fathers, right? Like a lot of guys whose dads were veterans became cops or firemen or, mm -hmm. uh, you know, and uh, in fact, to the point where this one lodge had so many police officers, they formed their own degree team. Everybody memorized a part. And if you were doing an initiation, you could call these guys. And we never did because my lodge was so old, the floor would creak above. And these guys would stomp their feet and like march hard. Very impressive. I saw them do a degree. It was crazy. It's like the Queens guards when they're doing their thing, you know, like you just watch it. You're like, wow, like they move their gun the same time, all that stuff. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I don't think there's any connection other than the lineage they come from. And they awesome. like that regimented, that sort of history. They like ritual, right? They like ritual. It sounds like they like that brotherhood thing. Yeah, exactly. like yeah. You got my back. I got yours as a cop that'll save your life. So. Well, thank you very much. David Gosling says uh, Freemasonry in the color orange. All, the only thing I can say about orange is there is a thing called the Orange Lodge. Um, and it's kind of an offshoot. There's a bunch of offshoots. The Eagles, the Elks, the Odd Fellows all have very similar structure. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't really know. There is really no significance with orange. I don't know where, where that's from. Thank you very much. Uh, what is the difference between the USA community and the European community? Depending on which country, like you go to France, they're going to, they're going to practice the type of masonry that you would experience in a Scottish Rite, full regalia, the masters dressed up. These guys wear like crazy ascots and like white gloves and all the rest. Uh, in the USA, I mean, you go to Hawaii, they're wearing shorts and a Tommy Bahama shirt, right? So, um, you know, some lodges are okay with casual, some not. If you go to a lodge and your dress coat is over your apron, some guys might complain. My uh, lodge, you wear the apron over your coat. So that's as contested as how to wear your ring. But uh, yeah, it varies all over the world. It's practice. Same idea, same moral principles, just the intricacies of how we do it are culturally adapted to their liking. Thank you. Thank you. We just got to roll through these questions. Okay. So for Michael Strange, Troubled Mind, he says, what about corrupt people as Freemasons, for instance, politicians is there a way to expel them for crimes against morality absolutely i mean we can't expel them politically or uh you know put them in jail but they're not welcome in our lodge and i'll give you a perfect example of that so if you look at the seinfeld episode there's one episode where kramer's about to get mugged and he's holding a pepper shaker and he by accident flashes this weird sign and they let him go because he's part of like the van buren boys that was actually in relation to masonic significance he and michael richards also went off in a nightclub spouted mm -hmm. some really hateful shit and the lodge disassociated with him instantly not what we're about oh, don't nothing to do with you you had to pass a reputation test before you were initiated if you are a child pedophile you're gone like nothing yeah. to do with that so a lot of these people have been masons they're excommunicated uh and when you have three and a half million people around the world, the world, the world, world. Get up, unfortunately for sure for sure but yeah we don't we don't back them they're gone Sylvain says, is there something that Freemasonry is searching for a long time? I wouldn't think so. No, I, I think a lot of the things are unknown. I saw some comments when we were at break about like the Ark of the Covenant is in mm -hmm. Ethiopia and all the rest. I, we're not, I, not formally searching. There are Freemasons that are searching for historical relics, religious relics. They're into this topic because they're a Mason. I think Dan Brown petitioned the Masonic Lodge afterwards because he realized that, hey, I can't make a conspiracy movie. These guys are actually about good things. Like they send him a thank you letter from the Grand Scottish Rite of Washington, D.C. Said, hey, thanks for making a movie and bringing light to this. And he's like, why aren't they mad? Why aren't they like, you put our secrets out there? Nothing I've said tonight on this show you cannot find on Google. There's a few things I won't ever say. And that's mm -hmm. the modes of recognition of how we discern ourselves as being Masons, because that's all we have. People have been persecuted and killed over the years for that secrecy. Out of respect for that, we still maintain. And to be totally honest, we like to mess with people. Oh, I, I can't understand. tell you that. You know, it's a secret. <laughs> My advice, if you're into this and you think it's cool and you want to know more, approach a lodge. There's thousands and thousands of lodges everywhere. Your city will have one. Your state will have hundreds of them. They have their email, their contact, all that. You can ask anything you want. They'll tell you. You want to see the lodge? You want to go in? No problem. So there's there, the only secret. We're not a secret society. We're a society with a few secrets. And they're ours. They're the way that we tell each other who we are. If I go to a lodge in England, they'll know I'm a Freemason. They'll put me through what's called a board of trial, 
It goes right back to your initiation. How are you made a Mason? How are you prepared? When, when was it? You know, what was the significance? It's the same questions you answered to prove your proficiency as an entered apprentice Mason. And you can go anywhere. Plus you have a dues card proves that you're a, a due, a, a, a paying member. If you're mm -hmm. lapsed on your dues and not supporting the, the motion, then no, you can't go visit other lodges because you're not pulling your weight, right? You're better to take a demit and come back when you can afford it. But I mean, a hundred bucks a year, what's that? You know, not a whole lot of money, right? Not a whole lot. Eight no. A month or something like that. Yeah. It just doesn't sound like a lot. It's just like, okay, a hundred bucks a year. Like, yeah. It's not that bad. Um, <clears throat> Sylvain says, if there's a problem inside the community, how do they solve it? I've never actually seen a problem. Every single person I've met has been in it for a long time. They're vetted. They do it because they want to do it, not because there's a gain. Uh, there really are no problems. The only problems they have is there's a bit of infighting. Old guys that don't want to change it. Some new guys have ideas. The old guys, you know, they kind of make fun of them. Or if a guy has to, like, check his note real quick to remember his line, they give him a hard time. There's a yeah. lot of chirping on the sidelines from a lot of undesirable people people that never contribute and all of a sudden they're going to tell you you did a shitty job at your degree, right? Like that's not for what we're about. Just like a classroom, a business, anything. Some of them you're closer to than others. Some are just there. We're all on our own individual journey, right? The, the secret to each individual Mason is how you feel, how you look at the world now, having taken an obligation that you're going to help somebody. You swore an oath that from this moment forward, you will dedicate your life as best you can without interfering with your family or your religion or your job. If somebody asks you for help, you will help them. And, you know, like I gave a homeless person 20 bucks the other day. That's all I had in my wallet. Cause I'm like, if this is my only test in life, I'm not going to fail. So, <laughs> you know, I'm not saying donate your entire life savings, but if you want to increase your karma, give a little away, you know? Yeah. No. And that's what it, that's what it seems like the freemasonry is about it's really just about helping other people and becoming a better person that's what actual freemasonry is if you read online it's where everything from devil worshipers to mm -hmm. illuminati and you know there's there's three different kind of misconceptions political political religious and cultural so you know politically they think we control the government culturally we're satan worshipers or the vatican's in on it and culturally we control hollywood and yeah. you know we're implanting things and Again, I believe there is a cabal of quote unquote Illuminati, people that are trying to implant and have their own agendas, but it's definitely not 80 year old guys that forget the cookies for the coffee and tea afterwards. <laughs> that's the honest to God truth on my daughter's life. That's the honest to God truth. No, thank you very much. Brian Whitaker asked, was Jack Demolay innocent? Well, they were accused of spitting on the cross, but yet they were warrior monks that would die for people that wanted to go to the Holy Land. So you mm -hmm. gave away all your wealth and risk your life to help people find religion, and now you're a heretic. So mm -hmm. the problem is the king of France saw the power, saw the rise, saw the, the allegiance people had to them more than the king. The Templars helped them out. The king took their money and didn't give a shit. So right, yeah, it started to become a problem, and he didn't erase us all because we're still here. Let's see, we got a couple. I don't know, but why do they cover one eye? I'm not sure, David Gosling. You... So that goes to we don't cover one eye, but again, the whole you know, eye in the triangle, it's emblematic. Uh, Even the Egyptians had it. It's the all seeing mm -hmm. eye, it's the omniscience of creation. It sees everything, knows everything, it is everything, it's infinite. So, again, how do you explain moral truths to people who are totally illiterate 3,000 years ago? You use symbols. And the symbol of the all-seeing eye is that whatever you do, something sees it. So act accordingly. It's a it's an, a moral compass. Michael Strange asks, are there any rivals, uh, rivalries between Freemason society lodges or other actual secret societies, i.e. Skull and Bones or something? No. So Skull and Bones, I think it's Yale University. It's a, mm -hmm. it's a collegiate base fraternity with some pretty macabre, like, uh, initiation scenes, lying in a coffin and being naked in front of your brothers and that's God weird. knows what else, you know, that, that is like, that's like they took the cool idea of the, the crypticness of it and just made it only about that and scare the hell out of their members. That is about helping each other out, get my son in. Cause you're my brother. We were both bonesmen. Mm -hmm. Bush was a bonesman. Yes. Yeah. We don't have nothing to do with those guys and to add our other rivalries. No, not, not any. 
Because you guys unless just you're, unless people. you're against helping people. If you're a Satan worshiper, I guess we're against that, but we're not rivaling anybody. 2,500 <laughs> years. Name something you can join today that was around 2,500 years ago. There's no rival. Yeah, I can't think of any. I'm trying to think, but I'm like, no, I don't think any. Nothing. can't think of anything. So as we kind of get close to the end, Sylvain has a good question for towards the end. What would you like to see in the future of Freemasonry? Which kind More of takes young members, back? more young guys to get off their butts and stop gaming and fooling around your phone. Go help somebody. Go make ham and cheese sandwiches for four hours and then get that promotion that you've wanted for two years within a week. You know, like stuff, spooky stuff starts to happen when you focus more on other people than yourself. So for me, only reason I wanted to do this show is to dispel myths, to explain that if you like this kind of stuff, if you're into history and philosophy and all that, you know, it's the seven liberal arts and sciences. So you got grammar, rhetoric, logic, arithmetic, geometry, music, and astronomy. Those are the main things Freemasonry encompasses, which is basically everything, right? So if you're into the liberal arts and sciences, go talk to somebody because you'd really enjoy it. You know, it's uh, you get out of it what you put into it. No, that's amazing. No, I, 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 I found that awesome, Lou. I'm glad you were able to come on and tell us, you know, all these, all these things that we thought were just like these mysterious things. You know, I just... <clears throat> Well, technically they are. I mean, I'm not supposed to be here. I'm not divulging uh -oh. any secrets, but we don't go around advertising and doing these kind of open panel shows. But I'm at a stage where I'm not just a new guy with a, an entered apprentice degree. I've been doing this long enough. I've uh, I've sought as much light as I possibly can. I can do more. It's just a matter of timing. And I yeah. could go through each body and eventually become the leader and then become the district leader and the provincial leader. That's more of a retirement thing for me. But mm -hmm. at this stage, I can confidently say it's time for us to not be so silent. Uh, talk to people. I mean, that's what we do. We're trying to attract good young people that want to do good for others and benefit themselves somehow. So if you don't talk about that, and there's not a lot of 80-year-olds can use a smartphone, let alone figure out how to get on a podcast. That's, so that's I'm using true. the platform as an opportunity to, to tell people what it's actually all about. No, that's awesome. No, that is so awesome. No, and you're right. I mean, older people aren't really like savvy on these things to be out no. there kind of talking about it. Or up at 11 till 1 a.m. I mean, they were in bed oh, at so five after dinner. Yeah, you know? they, yeah, they might be up in actually like an hour or two. Though. That's right. Yeah. For a bathroom <laughs> break, for sure. But a bathroom break. <laughs> Let's see. Michael Strange says, FYI, the lodge where I live has an open policy. What does open policy mean? Oh. Yeah, that's right. Oh, that's You're cordially nice. invited to come out for coffee, open house. Yeah, we used to do that a couple times a month. Yeah, if yeah, you go no. to the if you go to the Grand Lodge in Washington D.C. or the massive Scottish Rite Temple, and there's been History Channel documentaries and all this, everything I've said, you can look up for yourself. That and more. There are no secrets, even the actual secrets. If you look hard enough, you'll find them. But uh, yeah, that's uh, there is no secret. Like we have our symbol on the building, we wear it on our ring, we have it on a bumper sticker. We have websites and we post the night of our meeting, the time and who to email if you have questions. Like now I'm going to look at my, I'm going to look at the local ones website. Yeah. Just look up Grand Lodge, whatever state you're in, Grand Lodge, of California, Texas, New York. They're all, they're all sovereign bodies, but they all adhere to the same rules and they make sure that nobody's going rogue and doing stupid stuff or changing the ritual. It's all about self-improvement, you know, and they use a, a 2,500 year old system of, symbols and morals to take literal stonemason tools and adapt them to your own life and how you think about things and a picture tells a thousand words so a symbol has many more meanings than just the word and a symbol doesn't get lost in translation because you can describe that symbol in french or english or chinese using whatever words necessary to get out the meaning of that symbol so everybody gets it right it's not like anything's lost in translation so we keep it going just out of history out of nostalgia no, I love it. And I'm, I'm very happy that you, you know, dispelled a lot of these myths about it and, and opened up, you know, people's eyes to like, it's not what people think it is. And I think that happens with a lot of things. Like people don't really look, they just see like, oh, I Googled I heard, it. And I, read. I heard, I read, 
Uh, I learned it on YouTube, you know, I mean, I mean, yeah. even though we're on YouTube now, but, you know, we always encourage you to keep looking, guys. Don't just watch this video. Keep looking. Yeah. Go out there and look at other stuff. And you know? if, if this was a big, bad secret cabal, I would be taken out for coming on here no. and doing this. I showed you everything, told you every step of every degree. Nobody's going to tell you that stuff, but there's nothing to hide. It, it's a beautiful thing when you see others give. And then how that makes you feel. And what do you do? You turn around, do the exact same thing for the next guy. Cause you're like, that was friggin' cool. I want to help somebody else go through that. So you memorize a part you know, and you deliver it like letter. Perfect. You pause at the right times, you know, you, you show like, this is what we're talking about. Stonemasons used it for this. We interpret it for this, you know, like it's your, you get through to people and uh, yeah. And it's cool. It's fun. It's something different to do. It's a 2,500 year old philosophy club for gentlemen. Yeah. And ladies have their own. I'll have to look in the ladies one because I didn't know there was a lady one. Lady Sometimes they call them the Rebecca Lodge. The Eastern Star is a big one. Some podcasters said you're all Satanist. Yeah, a lot of people say that. Yeah. I wouldn't be wearing a Templar the first cross. First time I've been called a Satanist. <laughs> I, I wouldn't be a Templar if I was a Satanist because although masonry, you can be any religion, to be a Templar, you have to be Christian. You have to, because that's what they were. They were Christian warrior monks. And I'm not a, a Bible thumper. Oh. I don't, you know, attend church every Sunday. But if I ever stacked a brick in my life, yeah, my dad was a contractor. I, I Unfortunately, every Saturday, I was either helping with <laughs> roofing, plumbing, tiling, carpentry, uh, bricklaying, glazing. The only thing my dad wouldn't touch was electrical because it scared the hell out of him. Oh, yeah. But yeah. I had no choice but to help. I don't think I slept in until I was 15. So yeah, I laid a few bricks. Sleeping in was in. <laughs> and Portuguese, man. That's like in our DNA, you know? <laughs> more Italians, at least where I come from. More, more Italians are bricklayers. Portuguese, more roofers. That's so funny. Shitty job. Sounds like it. Yeah. But you worked hard as a teen. That probably like, you know. Oh, yeah. Stuff goes wrong in the house now. I just take care of it. You know, even electrical. Like I was big into car oh, yeah. audio as a kid. So yep. it's the same wiring, right? So I'm not scared of anything. So now my wife's like, you know, we could change that light. It's like, oh, now that she knows, she's the, like, the the third light in three years. Like, but she'll sell them on marketplace for more than she bought them for. But what she doesn't factor in is my time. It's worth something. <laughs> I am not your personal contractor. All right. I have a very busy life and a podcast. And, you know, I have dogs and, you know, my Masonic life and Jess Rogie and you UAB Studies podcast. Show, yeah. And so, all these beautiful people in the comments, you know, I will I say, that. I do like coming on your show. I think I've appeared on your show more than anybody else's other than our own. I think I you've like been it. on a lot this year. Yeah. Yeah. Your people are polite. They're intelligent. You know, it's late at night, so it's a different vibe. It's tough for me because I work all bloody day, especially on a I Wednesday, know. but I, I get a kick out of it. I like it. your music's cool. Your intro. I'm half asleep. I drink two sips of coffee. I hear your music. I'm like, it's go time. Let's do this. We gotta have exciting music because if I have anything slow, people are gonna be asleep. I gotta excite you back up every commercial. Yeah, no Barry Manilow, or I'm out. No, 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 like slow, slow music, nothing like that. No, and I'm very thank you very much for the compliment. I know a lot of people have been looking forward to this episode, and amazingly, I think you did answer a lot of people's questions because there were not as many as I thought. But the questions we got were amazing. I want to thank everybody for that too. And we have like one minute, Louis. Where can people find you and UAP Studies podcast? Yeah, so whether you go YouTube, Apple, Spotify, it's UAP Studies podcast. Websites UAP Studies podcast dot com. My Twitter handles at Louis Borges UAP. Go anywhere, type in UAP Studies podcast. You'll find me and Jason, big names, Jacques Vallee, Leslie Kane. We got Avi Loeb coming on. Oh, uh, Ben Hansen, like it's just on. Oh, I love it's Ben Hansen. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, we got William Henry, that's Ancient hard. Aliens. It's gonna be oh. crazy. And you're yeah. coming on our show in December for a podcast panel. I know. Another big hitter. Can't believe you got me. How'd you get me on your show? That's I don't know. I know. I know a guy who knows a girl and how that's how it happened. So. <laughs> no, but that's so exciting. No, thank you so much for coming on, Louie. My pleasure. No, you're always welcome. I know we always got to get Louie on a Wednesday, though. That's the best day for Louie. Yeah, because I'm off tomorrow, so I can sleep in a bit. Awesome. So. You can hang out. Well, actually, I got to close it right now. So thank you guys so much for hanging out tonight. We'll be back tomorrow with Preston Dennett, guys. We're going to talk about his new he's book. He's a beauty. Interviewed him a few weeks ago. Great guy. Love him. He's so, he's so sweet. And he just yeah. has this, like, great, 
great, uh, great, great vibe to him. Like great People energy. People like to, like to question him a lot and be like, there's no proof. And this guy's full of it. We got a lot of comments about him and I defended him for every single one. Like he wouldn't have lasted 30 years in this field if he was full of it. He would have been ripped yeah. apart already. So he's the real deal. He's the real deal. He's been researching, you know, guys. So tomorrow night we got to get out of here because it is one o'clock a.m. So yeah, I'm going to bed. Good night, Louie. Thank you for hanging out. And I'll talk My to pleasure. you soon. Yep. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. Thank you. Bye. All right, guys. We do have to close everything out. Good night, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow night.